few days ago, people in America has elected Donald Trump as our next president. Whether you like him or not, whether you agree with his agenda or not, he will be our 45th president of the United States. As a Christians, we are required and we are asked to pray for him and honor him and respect him. And what I observe in recent few days, you probably have read articles or saw news, this nation is greatly divided. The people opposing this newly elected president will have a demonstration in their campuses, in their major cities. As we observe this, what I personally realize is this nation, what we need the most is a fear of God. We cannot rely upon human government. You know, many, many years ago when communism in Russia collapsed, you know, we pointed a finger at them, you know, see, communism doesn't work, doesn't work. You know, we ridiculed them and so forth. But there's no perfect human government. Even democracy, we realize, because we are humiliated and humbled, because even democracy with the absence of God is a failure. And we recognize that every day. So we do pray for our human government and our leaders, which to lead a peaceful life. But what I recognize is church in America has to be revived. The churches in America, we need to invite the fear of God. And as a Christians, you and I, that we must restore the fear of God. You know, all of us as American Christians, we understand the grace and mercy of God. We have a plenty of those. But what I realize, what we lack is a fear of God because we have a rejected God from this nation. We have a despised God, and in return, He also despises us. And that's why we have these turmoils, and we experience these severe consequences because we rejected God. And as a Christians and as a churches, what I see is not absence of grace and mercy because we turned the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ and make them license to compromise and license to sin. What we need inside of our church, what we need in this nation is a fear of of God. As we continue on with the series on Back to the Basics, not only we want to pursue after intimacy with Jesus Christ, but also that we must realize the God whom we are in love with is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and He is fearful God. So when we come before Him, not only we come with a love but also we have to come with a reverence, with a fear of the Lord. Because He is a perfectly holy, righteous God. And He is a God of justice. So we want to learn today and remind ourselves and remind and examine our own personal lives how much of fear of God do we have in our daily living. And we want to learn it from life of Abraham. As we know, Abraham was called by God when he was about 75 years old. He didn't know where he was supposed to go, but without knowing it, he obeyed God and went to the land of Canaan. But he was not full of faith from the beginning. He failed miserably. He feared famine. He feared man and other kings. And sometimes he heeded the voice of his wife and went into Hagar and begotten Israel, which caused such a problem even until today. But God was patient with him after 25 years as God fulfilled his promise that I will give you a son, not only through you, but through Sarah. So they received the promise of God, which was Isaac. But there comes a day God will demand Abraham to offer his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice, go to the plain of Moriah 
and I will show you one of the mountains where you can sacrifice your only son Isaac. And to humans like you and I, is my God carnival? Why in the world would we ask him to sacrifice my son? But Abraham obeys the voice of God, and his fear of God is proven. So let's turn our Bible to the book of Genesis, chapter 22, from verse 10 through 12, and let us learn from him and how we can reveal the fear of God in our own life and also what happens when we don't fear God and also what kind of blessings that we may receive and obtain when we decide to fear God and Him alone. Book of Genesis, chapter 22, verse 10 through 12. Let us alternate. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And so this was on the mountain Moriah upon the altar. 11, you can read. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. Verse 12 altogether. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. God will approve Abraham. And God says, now I know you fear God. Now I know you fear God because you did not withheld your only son, Isaac. So how do we reveal and prove ourselves that we fear God? And let's learn from that this instant, how Abraham obeyed God. First, our reverence to God, our fear of God will be revealed when no one is watching us. When we are left alone and it's only between me and God and our true heart and our motivation and our action and conduct and our words will prove whether we fear God or fear man. See, when Abraham was asked of this sacrifice, he heard this voice alone. His wife didn't know about it. And he did not bother to talk about this to Sarah. Why? Because he knew Sarah would freak out. What? What are you talking about? Are you crazy? Offer Isaac the promise of God. He fulfilled in us after 25 years of waiting, and now you think God demands us to sacrifice him as offering, burnt offering? Absolutely not. Go pray one more time. I don't think you heard it right from God. Or did he call all his servants, including Isaac himself, and had a family discussion time? You know, I think I heard this voice, and Sarah said, Honey, you are aging. You are getting old. I think that you are hearing some wrong voices. He did not consult with his wife or his son or his servants or with his cabinet members. He knew it was a voice of God and him alone before God, and he had to decide to obey him. Our heart, our motivation, oftentimes God will test us when no one knows what's going on in my life, only God knows, and I'm alone, and I am completely naked before God. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 13, it says everything is revealed, and we are naked before God. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Whatever you do, even though Pastor Shine might not be watching you, even though your church members not around you, but God is always watching you. His eyes are upon you. Now, this is not, this is not just a terror of God, but this is a very comforting. Why? Because the Bible also declares that whatever we think, whatever desire we have, God answers our desires. God hears our groaning, you know, 
when my wife was conceived with our first son, Orim, you know how when women become pregnant, randomly they will crave for certain food. At midnight, honey, I want strawberries. At midnight, <laughs> how can I get the strawberries? <laughs> and once before Friday night worship, the camp used to worship on Friday in this sanctuary. And about 10 minutes before the Friday night worship, and I and my wife, we are talking, and my wife suddenly goes, Honey, I want to have a McDonald's French fries. It's not even Big Mac, it's a French fries. It's 10 minutes before the <laughs> worship. Uh, then I just decided to come to the sanctuary. So from the office building, I'm walking down in the Valencia parking lot, and then I meet Marion's father, and he carries these paper bag in his hand. And he goes, hey, Pastor Shine, I'm sorry, I don't have a hamburger, but I have a McDonald's French fries. Would you like to have it? And I say, are you kidding me? <laughs> Bring me that. <laughs> you know how God hears all our conversations. He knows our desire, and he knows I cannot get McDonald's French fries, and he will provide that. And it's so comforting. But at the same time, this causes us to fear him because he knows everything. He sees me every time, 24-7. You know, I go to India to preach the gospel to unreach the people's group every summer. Once, you know, how people donate fund and things like that. So randomly, people gave me surplus of fund, and I was put into envelope. And I lost on the way back the envelope. And I dig into all my bags. It's missing. And in this particular envelope, that was $800. Now, we didn't spend all money, and I was planning to return all laptop fund to Pastor Brandon, who is in charge of our finance. But it's missing. Now, I have a few choices to make. No one knows about it. Random individuals gave me surplus of this fund, and I lost it. It was not my mistake. I purposely did not spend it. It's not sitting against God. No one knows about it, so I can either just quiet myself, nothing, as if nothing has happened, or I can go to Pastor Brandon, let him be my accountability, and honestly say, hey, Pastor Brandon, I had a surplus of money in the envelope. I lost the $800. And he'll be okay with it. You know, it was my mistake. And church can forgive me, right? But God knows. God watches me. So I decided to take my personal $800 and put it in the envelope. And along with the other surplus of fund and I returned them back to Pastor Brandon. And when I was returning them, I said nothing about it. Because God knows. God watches me. When I am alone before God, when no one watches me, that's where my reverence before God is truly proven and recognized. Just because no one is watching me, do I commit sin? And is my action so different when I come to church and inside a building, my conduct and outside a church building, my conduct can be so different. You know, today in America, there are so many Christian bipolars. There are so many spiritual bipolars in this age. And that's why churches are so weak. Because our conduct inside a church building and outside a church building, they are so different. It's a bipolar and we have a bunch of them. Our fear of God is indeed proven when I'm alone before God. Abraham, he only heard that voice. He can ignore it and neglect it and go on with the life, and no one will find out. And also, it's a so radical demand from God. And if you bring it onto the discussion table, that will say, you're crazy. But he himself knew this was from God, and he wanted to obey him. 
Why? Because he feared God. And his fear of God was proven by God himself. Now, secondly, how do we reveal our reverence to God? How is our fear of God proven? Second thing is, when God demands the most precious thing in our life, and when I am able to surrender and give that up to God, then I am proven with the fear of God. God will test us. Oftentimes, Jesus even demanded us, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up the cross. And if you love anything more than you love me, whether your relationship, your money, your possession, your career, you are not worthy of me because he gave us all. So he will test us whether we really fear God demanding money from us, finance, our position, our fame, even our child. If our child is a hindrance to my worshiping God, then God will demand, can you put him aside? Come to me and worship me. Do you have a savings account in your bank? Would you give that to me for the gospel's sake? Even relationships, if it is unhealthy, if it is not prompted by the Holy Spirit, God may ask to give that up. Some of us know Josh McDowell. He's a famous itinerary speaker in CCC. Now they call themselves a crew. When he was a single, he was a dating particular sister. And he was about to go to a different state to preach and in the airplane Holy Spirit spoke to him, can you let her go? And he wrestled a lot. He wrestled a lot. But by the time the airplane was landing on the ground, he decided to let her go. His wife is Dottie McDowell. Now, she became, at the time, recently Christian. But she was dating with a guy more than three and a half years, and he was not obviously Christian. But the more she realized the word of God, you cannot be unequally yoked. And she had to make a decision because he, she knew God was asking her to let go of this relationship, let go of this guy. And she wrote the letter. And before she put it inside of this mailbox, you know, back then they didn't have an email, she circled around this mailbox for over an hour. But finally, in the fear of God, she put it in. When we read the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 1 through 2, the Bible says like this. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one will I look. On these people I will look upon. On these people I will show my own interest on them. What kind of people does he have interest? On him who is a poor and of a contrite heart or contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. Those who tremble at his word. When was last time you and I really trembled at his word? When he said, forgive him. When, we, when he said, give thanks, even in that evil circumstance. When, when was the last time we really trembled in the fear of God at his word? And really wrestled with our emotion. And really wrestled against our circumstances. And decided to obey his word. You know, I'm a preacher. Typically, I preach at least twice in a week. On Fridays and on Sundays. And what I realize is, even though I preach God's word, and I examine my life, do I ever think about at least one, power, one point of my sermon illustration, am I willing to obey that at least for one week? Because all of us oftentimes are healers of God's word, but we never decide to do his word. 
And that's why the book of James, it says, if you hear God's word and you don't do his word, you are like a person, look at mirror of yourself, and then immediately you go out, you forget about how you look like, and you return back to the mirror. Oh, that's my nose. These are my eyes, and that's my shiny bald head. Fear of God is proven when we obey even to the point of surrendering our most precious treasure to him when he demands. Fear of God is proven when we tremble at his word and decide to change and be transformed. Yes, by faith we are saved. Justification happens instantly. But sanctification will happen only when we fear God. Only when we try to abide in His Word and keep and obey His Word. And our God is a merciful God and patient enough. And He will take and hold our hands and walk this path of sanctification. But unless we have fear of God, even though we may come to church for over 30 years, we will become and end up pathetic, new, converted Christian. Our action and conduct never changing, ever changing. Inside a church, when we come to church on Sunday, we are going to ballroom. It's all show. It's all performance. But during six days, we live bipolar life. Christian bipolars, we become. But we don't even recognize it because spiritually we become so numb. Third way we can express our fear to the Lord is to please Him. Abraham, more than his wife, more than Isaac, his son, more than anybody else, even including himself, his desire was to please God and Him alone. Sacrificing his only son, Isaac, to the altar, what was his motivation? To please Him. The fear of God is revealed when our motivation is surely to please Him and Him alone. You know, a lot of us, we tend to please the people who are in higher authority. A lot of us, we fear man instead of fear God. Because we tend to please those people whom we fear. Whether it can be our boss at work, it can be a pastor at a church, it can be our teacher or our parents. But Apostle Paul said in the book of Galatians chapter 1 verse 10, For do I now persuade a man or God, or do I seek to please man? For if I still please man, I will not be a bondsman servant of Christ. I am always tempted, even when I share God's truth, am I Try to, trying to please man or try to please God. Because if I were to please people, I cannot speak the truth boldly. Why? Because I fear man. And good example is a King Saul. King Saul was commanded by the prophet Samuel. God said, go and destroy entire Amalekites. Both men and women, young and old, women, even women with the conception of children, destroy everything in every animal which breathe. Kill them all. But King Saul returns back because he feared the man, because he wanted to please his followers. He spared King Agag and also all the good oxen and sheep and goat because so-called, they wanted a sacrifice for the sake of worshiping God. Prophet Samuel was so grievous and rebuked him. You did not obey God. Partial obedience is not obedience. It's a disobedience. And he was rebuked by God through the prophet Samuel. And Samuel said, because of you rejected God's word, God rejected you. You know, even this man, until that end, he will not repent. You know what God, he said to Samuel? Honor me in front of 
all these people. Save my face. Come out with me so that we worship God. So these people may not know what's truly going on, that I was rejected by God. When we fear man instead of fear God, we try to please the people. Then God may end up despising us. Fourth way to reveal our true fear of God in our life is that Abraham loved God more than anything else. Abraham loved God more than anything else. His fear of God, his obedience showed he loved God more than his wife, his son, and him himself. You know, loving God requires a fear of God. Solomon women we talked about. Solomon was her husband, her lover. So she was deeply in love with him. But at the same time, she did not forget Solomon was her king. Even more so, when we come before God, how much we need to reveal him. Is that right? <laughs> because husbands, no matter how many times wives may say, Honey, I love you. Honey, I love you. If her conduct doesn't show respect to her husband, he will not able to feel her love. How much more so when we come before our creator, our ultimate king and king of kings, when we love him, when we lack fear of God, that love may be a fake. Book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verse 12, it says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him? Fearing him, loving him are included to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Our desire is to enjoy his intimacy. Our desire is to continually grow our love for our God. But if we really want to love God, we must fear him. Fear the reverence, not frightening. And when we love him, it may demand everything we own. And that coincides with how much we fear God. Peter, because he feared other men, chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees, he ended up denying Jesus three times. And also he feared for his own life. But after Jesus was resurrected at the Sea of Galilee, Jesus will call Peter and his disciples again. He prepared the breakfast for them. And after meal, Jesus will ask particularly to Peter, Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now, in Greek language, more than these, these in Greek is a toton. Now, in Greek, unlike English, English probably had a gender before. They have a gender in every vocabulary. For example, sun is masculine, while moon is a feminine. And like this podium is a neuter, is a, for the things like that. So this tatan is both masculine and neuter. And I believe Jesus used purposefully when he said all these, tatan. Why? Because it can be both masculine and neuter. What he's asking Peter is, Peter, do you love me more than these, more than these people, my other disciples, your friends? Do you love me more than 153 large fish you caught? Do you love me more than anything in the world, even yourself, your own life? Do you love me in such a way? Jesus will ask Peter. Peter replies, Lord, do you know all things? You know that I love you and feed my sheep. Unless we fear God, we will not be able to wholesomely surrender our everything, our totan, and say, Jesus, I love you more than these. And that 
is a fear of God. So we reveal our own fear of God when we are alone, when no one is watching us. And secondly, when we obey and even to a point that we want to surrender our most tre treasure to God, our fear of God is revealed. And thirdly, when we please God more than we try to please anyone in the world, we fear God. And fourthly, we fear God when we love Him above anything else. Now, what happens when we do not fear God? It proves that we are prideful. Because of our own pride, we cannot fear God. Secondly, when we don't fear God, we end up fearing men. We can say all kinds of things. Oh, I fear God. But when we do not fear God, we fear God. You know, human accountability is very important. As we walk and grow in our faith and walk in Christ Jesus, we say we need a mentor. Yes, of course, we need a mentor. And we need a human accountability. Be accountable to me so that I don't fall away or I don't sin against God. But that human accountability is not perfect. It's imperfect. There's a limitation. One good example is a King Jehoshia, Jeho Jehoiasi. In the second king, chapter 12, verse 2, this Jehoash, he became king when he was seven years old. He became king of Judah. But at that time, because he was so young, he had a mentor, the priest, and his name was Jehoiada, Jehoiada. something like that. He's a dad. So King Jehoash, will be fearing God as long as he was alive. But after he was died, his heart changed and began to not rely upon God. And God was despised and conspiracy happened and his servants killed this king. So here it says that Jehoash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Jehoash Aida, the priest, instructed him. So what we see in our church is a people who fear man more than they fear God. So when their mentor is around, when church members are around, their conduct is righteous. But when Pastor Shine is an hour around, their conduct can be so different. And it proves you fear man more than you fear God. And this Jehoash, the king, he never internally be able to understand what kind of God he was serving. He lacked the fear of God. So when man was removed, because he feared man more than he feared God, his conduct and lifestyle changed. And a lot of us can be like that. But let us learn from Samuel and David. Because they truly feared God. It didn't matter to him what kind of leader they were under. For example, Samuel was growing up under the leadership of priest Eli. Eli was a wicked priest. God already rejected him. But he never complained about leadership, but he grew in the fear of the Lord, and he became spiritual national leader. David was always like that. In the fear of God, when King Saul was chasing him to kill his life, but once God allowed Saul sleeping in the cave of Engedi, he was able to kill this man. However, I cannot touch God's anointed because he feared God. And he's a leader. King Saul was wicked. But David grew to be national leader who feared God. We have no excuse whether we have mentors, whether we have righteous leaders or not, if we really fear God, then our life will be sanctified. And we will learn to fear the Lord. You know, when we do not fear God, 
Lastly, what happens is we become hypocrites. We become performers. Our Christian life becomes with a such a dichotomy. And we become one of the spiritual bipolars. Inside a church building, we behave a certain ways. And outside a church building, we behave completely different. And some people who observe us, our life outside a church building, we wonder they may be able to ever recognize we were a Christian in the first place. But let's conclude this message, understanding our God is not just a fearsome God, but our God is so merciful and gracious. He wants to bless us. There are so many blessings when we fear Him. Let me share with you a few of them. First, when we fear God, our desires will be granted. Psalm 115, verse 13, He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. Psalm 145, 19, He will fulfill the desires of those who fear Him. He will also hear their cry and save them. Abraham was a good example. When his fear was proven, in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 16 18, God makes another covenant with him. He says, blessings I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of earth shall be blessed, and because you have obeyed my voice. He was willing to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Later on, God will sacrifice his only son Jesus for the nations and the descendants of Abraham, son of David, Jesus, becomes the seed of blessings for all nations. That's how much when our fear of God is granted and proven by God. Secondly, when we fear God, God gives us wisdom. Proverbs 1, seven: the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments, His praise endures forever. When we fear God, God will grant us wisdom because we need wisdom to be successful in this life. When we fear God, we obtain and cultivate holiness in our life. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. When we fear God and Him alone, we do not fear man. We become so freed and we become so bored when we fear God and Him alone, we become boldest the person on the face of earth. Peter is a good example. Because he feared the scribes and Pharisees and priests, he ended up denying Jesus. After baptism of the Holy Spirit, he became so bold. Before same people, he preached the gospel, exalted the name of Jesus. When we fear God, we become bold. And there are many, many Blessing some more. Let me quickly give us some examples. When we fear God, secret of God will be revealed in our life. Psalm 31, verse 19. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you, the presence of sons of men. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not, that's goodness given. Secret of God will be revealed. Psalm 25, verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him. And I of the Lord will be upon them, those who fear Him. Psalm 33, verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope in His mercy. Angels of the Lord will surround those who fear Him. Psalm 34, verse 7. 
the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Salvation will be nearer to those who fear God. Psalm 85 verse 9, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. God's mercy will be upon those who fear him. Psalm 103 verse 11. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. Even God will provide a food. God will buy food for those who fear him. Psalm 111 verse 5. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. And also, God will be their help and shield to those who fear him. Psalm 115, verse 11. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. There are so many blessings when we fear God that God promises to us. Fear God. Not men. When we fear Him alone, there will be true freedom we will enjoy. It's not bondage. When we fear God, we'll be so bold of our circumstances. We'll be so bold before men and women. And when we are fearful of God, He becomes our defender. He becomes our shield. He becomes our rest. He becomes our provider. He is our peace, and he is our joy. Let us all rise. How are we when no one is watching us? Where does my heart drift away? When no one is watching me. How is my conduct? When no one is watching behind my back, when I look at the screen, what do I look for? When no church member is around, how is my anger? How do I treat my emotion? How are my words? Our nation desperately needs devout Christians. Our nation desperately needs a church that fears the Lord and trembles at His word. Our government is not our refuge. Our God is. I predict few coming years will be very noisome, will be very interesting. But our refuge, our shield, and our fighter is our God. And He provides, protects, leads those who fear Him. Can we ask God, God, instead of fearing circumstances and men, cause me to fear You. I fear You, God. Not only do I love You, with a reverence, I love you. Change my life. Change my life, Lord. Let me, be, let me not be another Christian bipolar. Let's call his name. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.